the interesting thing about this book is that he divests himself of all the slapstick, that Thompson twins aren't even in it, and Professor Calculus vanishes very, very soon. And it's really just Tintin and Haddock in the mountains on their own. You can see by this time that the, the techniques he was using um, have, have developed considerably since the pre-war books. I mean, for instance, uh, this cover here, um, he's doing several different versions of everything. So Snowy appears three times in different possible positions before we see what uh, finally came about. And what he was doing at this stage uh, was doing a lot of life drawing where he would pose, or his assistants would pose, and they would actually capture the, the precise physical position of a person. If you see, for instance, this rather interesting picture of Captain Haddock getting a rock on the back of his rucksack, you can see the pictures that have been drawn of Hergé himself taking up the position, and then several different versions on the page of Haddock in the final position before we, we see how it came out. The degree of detail you've got here shows that you're not really dealing with a cartoonist. I mean, Hergé is not, is not a cartoonist, he's a comic artist which is a different thing altogether. I mean, he was doing very, very careful line drawings. The only cartooning involved is the face, which is the caricature. Uh, and yet, you can see, interestingly, that he does have sometimes the cartoonist technique when it comes to the humor. For instance, um, there's a very interesting one here of Haddock running up um, an airport gangway, and he's got something in his eye, and he can't see that the plane isn't on the other end of it. And originally, Hergé draws the frame where Haddock falls off the gangway. But in fact, the true cartoonist um, wouldn't put that frame in. And Hergé divests himself of that frame. You just see Haddock running up the gangway and then cut immediately to him with covered in bandages and plasters, which is a, a real cartoonist way of doing things. All the latest Tintin books were begun in Tintin magazine. Uh, and you can see quite often differences between the magazine version and the book version. A lot of it was redrawn. For instance, this opening shot of the Swiss Alps vanishes mysteriously from the book form. But um, very often there are clues to the magazine origins of these stories in the, in the books. For instance, uh, if you look here at the bottom of page eight, every two pages there's a cliffhanger because the people who were reading the magazine had to uh, be made to, to buy next week's issue. And the bottom of page here we can see the car is about to uh, hit the drawing pin. It's one of the less subtle uh, cliffhangers he did. And then at the top of the next page, page nine, we see the beginning of the next week's episode when the car whizzes past the drawing pin. Hergé liked to get a lot of topical references in, and in Tintin Tibet, the abominable snowman is just that kind of thing. He based his yeti initially on King Kong. something about the subject. He came up with a conclusion that the Abominable Snowman was actually a very friendly character. I think he's just lonely and in the end it's quite sad when um, they take Chang home and he sort of is a bit lonely. I think he was only keeping him there because he wanted a friend and he was he saved him from um, the snow and the blizzard so I think he was I think he was quite good at heart. And here in fact is uh, the last page of the book in all its various stages. You can see the very, very rough uh, early sketches. Then he's done a slightly more detailed one here, doodled all over it. As I said, he was mainly interested in the figures. You can see he's drawn every figure several times. And his assistants come in and, and draw the background. So here, Hergé would have drawn the Yeti and uh, the assistants would have done the mountains in the background. All the placing of frames in a page the dialogues also, that's my work. All the characters are drawn by myself. Then afterwards come my assistants with the backgrounds. But the characters, I want to draw them myself. By this time, um, he's getting more and more cinematic. So you see a lot more close-ups. You see uh, that he's beginning to, to plot the scenes, not just with life models, but also he would draw the scenes from above like a room and he would look at it like as if he was a film director, how each shot would link into the next shot. And this comes more and more in the, the later you go. So something like Flight 714, for instance, is very cinematic. It looks like a storyboard for a film. 
Uh, and if you look at this sequence here, the sense of movement he gets when the plane tries to land on a tiny prefabricated airstrip uh, is quite remarkable. It looks simple on the page, but this is just a perfect example of how to draw uh, in bon dessiné style, how to draw movement. And if you look at any classics, you'll see there is an eternal quality in the characters. The setting is an, an attractive part of it, but it's set dressing. And basically, it's all about people. And this is where Tintin, Dirk, Castafiore, and the rest come through. They are actually timeless, and I think they'll go on and on.